Chapter 6 The Adventure of the Bald Archaeologist I spent the night on a shelf of the hillside, in the lee of a boulder where the heather grew long and soft. It was a cold business, for I had neither coat nor waistcoat. These were in Mr. Turnbull's keeping, as was Scudder's little book, my watch, and, worst of all, my pipe and tobacco pouch. Only my money accompanied me in my belt, and about half a pound of ginger biscuits in my trousers pocket. I supped off half those biscuits, and by worming myself deep into the heather got some kind of warmth. My spirits had risen, and I was beginning to enjoy this crazy game of hide-and-seek. So far I had been miraculously lucky. The milkman, the literary innkeeper, Sir Harry, the roadman, and the idiotic Marmy were all pieces of undeserved good fortune. Somehow, the first success gave me a feeling that I was going to pull the thing through. My chief trouble was that I was desperately hungry. When a Jew shoots himself in the city and there is an inquest, the newspapers usually report that the deceased was well-nourished. I remember thinking that they would not call me well-nourished if I broke my neck in a bog hole. I lay and tortured myself, for the ginger biscuits merely emphasized the aching void, with the memory of all the good food I had thought so little of in London. There were Paddock's crisp sausages and fragrant shavings of bacon and shapely poached eggs. How often I had turned up my nose at them! There were the cutlets they did at the club, and a particular ham that stood on the cold table, for which my soul lusted. My thoughts hovered over all varieties of mortal edible, and finally settled on a porterhouse steak and a quart of bitter with a Welsh rabbit to follow. In longing hopelessly for these dainties, I fell asleep. I woke very cold and stiff about an hour after dawn. It took me a little while to remember where I was, for I had been very weary and had slept heavily. I saw the first pale blue sky through a net of heather, then a big shoulder of hill, and then my own boots placed neatly in a blaeberry bush. I raised myself up on my arms and looked down into the valley, and that one look set me lacing up my boots in a mad haste, for there were men below, not more than a quarter of a mile off, spaced out on the hillside like a fan and beating the heather. Marmy had not been slow in looking for his revenge. I crawled out of my shelf into the cover of a boulder, and from it gained a shallow trench which slanted up the mountain face. This led me presently into the narrow gully of a burn, by way of which I scrambled to the top of the ridge. From there I looked back and saw that I was still undiscovered. My pursuers were patiently quartering the hillside and moving upwards. Keeping behind the skyline, I ran for maybe half a mile, till I judged I was above the uppermost end of the glen. Then I showed myself, and was instantly noted by one of the flankers, who passed the word to the others. I heard cries coming up from below, and saw that the line of search had changed its direction. I pretended to retreat over the skyline, but instead went back the way I had come, and in twenty minutes was behind the ridge overlooking my sleeping place. From that viewpoint I had the satisfaction of seeing the pursuit streaming up the hill at the top of the glen on a hopelessly false scent. I had before me a choice of routes, and I chose a ridge which made an angle with the one I was on, and so would put a deep glen between me and my enemies. The exercise had warmed my blood, and I was beginning to enjoy myself amazingly. As I went, I breakfasted on the dusty remnants of the ginger biscuits. I knew very little about the country, and I hadn't a notion what I was going to do. I trusted to the strength of my legs, but I was well aware that those behind me would be familiar with the lie of the land, and that my ignorance would be a heavy handicap. I saw in front of me a sea of hills, rising very high towards the south, 
but northwards breaking down into broad ridges which separated wide and shallow dales. The ridge I had chosen seemed to sink after a mile or two to a moor, which lay like a pocket in the uplands. That seemed as good a direction to take as any other. My stratagem had given me a fair start, call it twenty minutes, and I had the width of a glen behind me before I saw the first heads of the pursuers. The police had evidently called in local talent to their aid, and the men I could see had the appearance of herds or gameskeepers. They hallooed at the sight of me, and I waved my hand. Two dived into the glen and began to climb my ridge, while the others kept their own side of the hill. I felt as if I were taking part in a schoolboy game of hare and hounds. But very soon it began to seem less of a game. Those fellows behind me were hefty men on their native heath. Looking back I saw that only three were following direct, and I guessed that the others had fetched a circuit to cut me off. My lack of local knowledge might very well be my undoing, and I resolved to get out of this tangle of glens to the pocket of moor I had seen from the tops. I must so increase my distance as to get clear away from them, and I believed I could do this if I could find the right ground for it. If there had been cover, I would have tried a bit of stalking. But on these bare slopes you could see a fly a mile off. My hope must be in the length of my legs and the soundness of my wind, but I needed easier ground for that, for I was not bred a mountaineer. How I longed for a good Afrikander pony! I put on a great spurt and got off my ridge and down into the moor before any figures appeared on the skyline behind me. I crossed a burn and came out on a high road which made a pass between two glens. All in front of me was a big field of heather sloping up to a crest which was crowned with an odd feather of trees. In the dike by the roadside was a gate from which a grass-grown track led over the first wave of the moor. I jumped the dike and followed it, and after a few hundred yards, as soon as it was out of sight of the highway, the grass stopped, and it became a very respectable road, which was evidently kept with some care. Clearly it ran to a house, and I began to think of doing the same. Hitherto my luck had held, and it might be that my best chance would be found in this remote dwelling. Anyhow, there were trees there, and that meant cover. I did not follow the road but the burn side which flanked it on the right, where the bracken grew deep and the high banks made a tolerable screen. It was well I did so, for no sooner had I gained the hollow than, looking back, I saw the pursuit topping the ridge from which I had descended. After that I did not look back. I had no time. I ran up the burn side, crawling over the open places, and for a large part wading in the shallow stream. I found a deserted cottage with a row of phantom peat stacks and an overgrown garden. Then I was among young hay, and very soon had come to the edge of a plantation of wind-blown firs. From there I saw the chimneys of the house smoking a few hundred yards to the left. I forsook the burnside, crossed another dike, and almost before I knew was on a rough lawn. A glance back told me that I was well out of sight of the pursuit, which had not yet passed the first lift of the moor. The lawn was a very rough place, cut with a scythe instead of a moor, and planted with beds of scrubby rhododendrons. A brace of black game, which are not usually garden birds, rose at my approach. The house before me was the ordinary moorland farm, with a more pretentious whitewashed wing added. Attached to this wing was a glass veranda, and through the glass I saw the face of an elderly gentleman meekly watching me. I stalked over the border of coarse hill gravel and entered the open veranda door. Within was a pleasant room, 
glass on one side, and on the other a mass of books. More books showed in an inner room. On the floor, instead of tables, stood cases such as you see in a museum, filled with coins and queer stone implements. There was a knee-hole desk in the middle, and seated at it, with some papers and open volumes before him, was the benevolent old gentleman. His face was round and shiny, like Mr. Pickwick's. Big glasses were stuck on the end of his nose, and the top of his head was as bright and bare as a glass bottle. He never moved when I entered, but raised his placid eyebrows and waited on me to speak. It was not an easy job, with about five minutes to spare, to tell a stranger who I was and what I wanted, and to win his aid. I did not attempt it. There was something about the eye of the man before me, something so keen and knowledgeable, that I could not find a word. I simply stared at him and stuttered. You seem in a hurry, my friend, he said slowly. I nodded towards the window. It gave me a prospect across the moor through a gap in the plantation, and revealed certain figures half a mile off straggling through the heather. Ah, I see, he said, and took up a pair of field glasses through which he patiently scrutinized the figures. A fugitive from justice, eh? Well, we'll go into the matter at our leisure. Meantime, I object to my privacy being broken in upon by the clumsy rural policeman. Go into my study and you will see two doors facing you. Take the one on the left and close it behind you. You will be perfectly safe. And this extraordinary man took up his pen again. I did as I was bid and found myself in a little dark chamber which smelt of chemicals and was lit only by a tiny window high up in the wall. The door had swung behind me with a click like the door of a safe. Once again, I had found an unexpected sanctuary. All the same, I was not comfortable. There was something about the old gentleman which puzzled and rather terrified me. He had been too easy and ready, almost as if he had expected me. And his eyes had been horribly intelligent. No sound came to me in that dark place. For all I knew, the police might be searching the house. And if they did, they would want to know what was behind this door. I tried to possess my soul in patience. And to forget how hungry I was. Then I took a more cheerful view. The old gentleman could scarcely refuse me a meal, and I fell to reconstructing my breakfast. Bacon and eggs would content me, but I wanted the better part of a flitch of bacon and half a hundred eggs. And then, while my mouth was watering in anticipation, there was a click, and the door stood open. I emerged into the sunlight to find the master of the house sitting in a deep armchair in the room he called his study, and regarding me with curious eyes. Have they gone? I asked. They have gone. I convinced them that you had crossed the hill. I do not choose that the police should come between me and one whom I am delighted to honor. This is a lucky morning for you, Mr. Richard Hannay. As he spoke, his eyelids seemed to tremble and to fall a little over his keen gray eyes. In a flash, the phrase of Scudder's came back to me, when he had described the man he most dreaded in the world. He had said that he could hood his eyes like a hawk, then I saw that I had walked straight into the enemy's headquarters. My first impulse was to throttle the old ruffian and make for the open air. He seemed to anticipate my intention, 
for he smiled gently and nodded to the door behind me. I turned and saw two men servants who had me covered with pistols. He knew my name, but he had never seen me before, and as the reflection darted across my mind, I saw a slender chance. I don't know what you mean, I said roughly, and who are you calling Richard Hannay? My name's Ensley. So, he said, still smiling. But of course you have others. We won't quarrel about a name. I was pulling myself together now, and I reflected that my garb, lacking coat and waistcoat and collar, would at any rate not betray me. I put on my surliest face and shrugged my shoulders. I suppose you're going to give me up after all and call it a damn dirty trick. My God, I wish I had never seen that cursed motor car. Here's the money and be damned to ya and I flung four sovereigns on the table. He opened his eyes a little. Oh no, I shall not give you up. My friends and I have a little private settlement with you, that is all. You know a little too much, Mr. Hannay. You are a clever actor, but not quite clever enough. He spoke with assurance, but I could see the dawning of a doubt in his mind. Oh, for God's sake, stop, John, I cried. Everything's against me. I haven't had a bit of luck since I came on shore at Lythe. What's the harm in a poor devil with an empty stomach picking up some money he finds in a bust-up motor car? That's all I done. And for that, I've been chivied for two days by those blasted bobbies over those blasted hills. I tell you, I'm fair sick of it. You can do what you like, old boy. Ned Ainsley's got no fight left in him. I could see that the doubt was gaining. Will you oblige me with the story of your recent doings? He asked. I can't, Governor, I said in real beggar's whine. I've not had a bite to eat for two days. Give me a mouthful of food, and then you'll hear the God's truth. I must have showed my hunger in my face, for he signaled to one of the men in the doorway. A bit of cold pie was brought, and a glass of beer, and I wolfed them down like a pig. Or rather, like Ned Ainsley, for I was keeping up my character. In the middle of my meal he spoke suddenly to me in German, but I turned on him a face as blank as a stone wall. Then I told him my story, how I had come off an archangel ship at Lythe a week ago, and was making my way overland to my brother at Wigton. I had run short of cash, I hinted vaguely at a spree, and I was pretty well on my uppers when I had come on a hole in a hedge, and looking through, had seen a big motor car lying in the burn. I had poked about to see what had happened, and had found three sovereigns lying on the seat and one on the floor. There was nobody there or any sign of an owner, so I had pocketed the cash. But somehow the law had got after me. When I had tried to change a sovereign in a baker's shop, the woman had cried on the police, and a little later, when I was washing my face in a burn, I had been nearly gripped and it only got away by leaving my coat and waistcoat behind me. They can have the money back, I cried, for a fat lot of good it's done me. Those perishers are all down on a poor man. Now, if it had been you, Governor, that had found the quids, nobody would have troubled you. You're a good liar, Mr. Henney, he said. I flew into a rage, Stop fooling, damn you! I tell you my name's Ainsley, and I never heard of anyone called Henny in my born days. I'd sooner have the police than you with your Hennies and your monkey-faced pistol tricks. No, Gutner, I beg pardon, I don't mean that. I'm much obliged to you for the grub, 
and I'll thank you to let me go now the coast's clear. It was obvious that he was badly puzzled. You see, he had never seen me, and my appearance must have altered considerably from my photographs if he had got one of them. I was pretty smart and well-dressed in London, and now I was a regular tramp. I do not propose to let you go. If you are what you say you are, you will soon have a chance of clearing yourself. If you are what I believe you are, I do not think you will see the light much longer. He rang a bell, and a third servant appeared from the veranda. I want the Lanchester in five minutes, he said. There will be three to luncheon. Then he looked steadily at me, and that was the hardest ordeal of all. There was something weird and devilish in those eyes, cold, malignant, unearthly, and most hellishly clever. They fascinated me like the bright eyes of a snake. I had a strong impulse to throw myself on his mercy and offer to join his side. And if you consider the way I felt about the whole thing, you will see that that impulse must have been purely physical, the weakness of a brain mesmerized and mastered by a stronger spirit. But I managed to stick it out and even to grin. You'll know me the next time, Governor, I said. Carl, he spoke in German to one of the men in the doorway. Will you put this fellow in the storeroom till I return? And you will be answerable to me for his keeping. I was marched out of the room with a pistol at each ear. The storeroom was a damp chamber in what had been the old farmhouse. There was no carpet on the uneven floor, and nothing to sit down on but a school form. It was black as pitch, for the windows were heavily shuttered. I made out by groping that the walls were lined with boxes and barrels and sacks of some heavy stuff. The whole place smelt of mold and disuse. My jailers turned the key in the door, and I could hear them shifting their feet as they stood on guard outside. I sat down in that chilly darkness in a very miserable frame of mind. The old boy had gone off in a motor to collect the two ruffians who had interviewed me yesterday. Now they had seen me as the roadman, and they would remember me, for I was in the same rig. What was a roadman doing twenty miles from his beat pursued by the police? A question or two would put them on the track. Probably they had seen Mr. Turnbull, probably Marmy too. Most likely they could link me up with Sir Harry, and then the whole thing would be crystal clear. What chance had I in this moorland house with three desperados and their armed servants? I began to think wistfully of the police, now plodding over the hills after my wraith. They, at any rate, were fellow countrymen and honest men, and their tender mercies would be kinder than these ghoulish aliens. But they wouldn't have listened to me. That old devil with the eyelids had not taken long to get rid of them. I thought he probably had some kind of graft with the constabulary. Most likely he had letters from cabinet ministers saying he was to be given every facility for plotting against Britain. That's the sort of owlish way we run our politics in this jolly old country. The three would be back for lunch, so I hadn't more than a couple of hours to wait. It was simply waiting on destruction, for I could see no way out of this mess. I wished that I had Scudder's courage, for I am free to confess I didn't feel any great fortitude. The only thing that kept me going was that I was pretty furious. It made me boil with rage to think of those three spies getting the pull on me like this. I hoped that at any rate I might be able to twist one of their necks before they downed me. The more I thought of it, the angrier I grew, 
and I had to get up and move about the room. I tried the shutters, but they were the kind that lock with a key, and I couldn't move them. From the outside came the faint clucking of hens in the warm sun. Then I groped among the sacks and boxes. I couldn't open the latter, and the sack seemed to be full of things like dog biscuits that smelt of cinnamon. But as I circumnavigated the room, I found a handle in the wall which seemed worth investigating. It was the door of a wall cupboard, what they call a press in Scotland, and it was locked. I shook it, and it seemed rather flimsy. For want of something better to do, I put my strength on that door, getting some purchase on the handle by looping my braces around it. Presently the thing gave with a crash, which I thought would bring in my warders to inquire. I waited for a bit, and then started to explore the cupboard shelves. There was a multitude of queer things there. I found an odd vesta or two in my trouser pockets and struck a light. It was out in a second, but it showed me one thing. There was a little stock of electric torches on one shelf. I picked one up and found it was in working order. With the torch to help me, I investigated further. There were bottles and cases of queer-smelling stuffs, chemicals no doubt for experiments, and there were coils of fine copper wire and yanks and yanks of thin oiled silk. There was a box of detonators and a lot of cord for fuses. Then away at the back of the shelf, I found a stout brown cardboard box, and inside it a wooden case. I managed to wrench it open, and within lay half a dozen little grey bricks, each a couple of inches square. I took one up, and found that it crumbled easily in my hand. Then I smelt it and put my tongue to it. After that, I sat down to think. I hadn't been a mining engineer for nothing, and I knew lintonite when I saw it. With one of these bricks, I could blow the house to smithereens. I had used the stuff in Rhodesia and knew its power. But the trouble was that my knowledge wasn't exact. I had forgotten the proper charge and the right way of preparing it, and I wasn't sure about the timing. I had only a vague notion, too, as to its power, for though I had used it, I had not handled it with my own fingers. But it was a chance, the only possible chance. It was a mighty risk, but against it was an absolute black certainty. If I used it, the odds were, as I reckoned, about five to one in favor of my blowing myself into the treetops. But if I didn't, I should very likely be occupying a six-foot hole in the garden by the evening. That was the way I had to look at it. The prospect was pretty dark either way, but anyhow there was a chance, both for myself and for my country. The remembrance of Little Scudder decided me. It was about the beastliest moment of my life, for I'm no good at these cold-blooded resolutions. Still I managed to rake up the pluck, to set my teeth and choke back the horrid doubts that flooded in on me. I simply shut off my mind and pretended I was doing an experiment as simple as Guy Fawkes' fireworks. I got a detonator and fixed it to a couple of feet of fuse. Then I took a quarter of a lintonite brick and buried it near the door below one of the sacks in a crack of the floor, fixing the detonator to it. For all I knew, half those boxes might be dynamite. If the cupboard held such deadly explosives, why not the boxes? In that case, there would be a glorious skyward journey for me and the German servants and about an acre of surrounding country. There was also the risk that the detonation might set off the other bricks in the cupboard, for I had forgotten most that I knew about lintonite. But it didn't do to begin thinking about the possibilities. The odds were horrible, but I had to take them. 
I ensconced myself just below the sill of the window and lit the fuse. Then I waited for a moment or two. There was dead silence, only a shuffle of heavy boots in the passage and the peaceful cluck of hens from the warm out of doors. I commended my soul to my maker and wondered where I would be in five seconds. A great wave of heat seemed to surge upwards from the floor and hang for a blistering instant in the air. Then the wall opposite me flashed into a golden yellow and dissolved with a rending thunder that hammered my brain into a pulp. Something dropped on me, catching the point of my left shoulder, and then I think I became unconscious. My stupor can scarcely have lasted beyond a few seconds. I felt myself being choked by thick yellow fumes and struggled out of the debris to my feet. Somewhere behind me I felt fresh air. The jams of the window had fallen, and through the ragged rent the smoke was pouring out into the summer noon. I stepped over the broken lintel and found myself standing in a yard in a dense and acrid fog. I felt very sick and ill, but I could move my limbs and I staggered blindly forward, away from the house. A small mill lathe ran in a wooden aqueduct at the other side of the yard, and into this I fell. The cool water revived me, and I had just enough wits left to think of escape. I squirmed up the lathe among the slippery green slime till I reached the mill wheel. Then I wriggled through the axle hole into the old mill, and tumbled to a bed of chaff. A nail caught the seat of my trousers, and I left a wisp of heather mixture behind me. The mill had been long out of use. The ladders were rotten with age, and in the loft the rats had gnawed great holes in the floor. Nausea shook me, and a wheel in my head kept turning, while my left shoulder and arm seemed to be stricken with the palsy. I looked out of the window and saw a fog still hanging over the house, and smoke escaping from an upper window. Please, God, I had set the place on fire, for I could hear confused cries coming from the other side. But I had no time to linger, since this mill was obviously a bad hiding place. Anyone looking for me would naturally follow the laid and I made certain the search would begin as soon as they found that my body was not in the storeroom. From another window I saw that on the far side of the mill stood an old stone dovecot. If I could get there without leaving tracks, I might find a hiding place, for I argued that my enemies, if they thought I could move, would conclude I had made for open country, and would go seeking me on the moor. I crawled down the broken ladder, scattering chaff behind me to cover my footsteps. I did the same on the mill floor and on the threshold where the door hung on broken hinges. Peeping out, I saw that between me and the dovecote was a piece of bare cobbled ground where no footmarks would follow. Also it was mercifully hid by the mill buildings from any view from the house. I slipped across the space, got to the back of the dovecote, and prospected a way of ascent. That was one of the hardest jobs I ever took on. My shoulder and arm ached like hell, and I was so sick and giddy that I was always on the verge of falling. But I managed it somehow. By the use of outjutting stones and gaps in the masonry and a tough ivy root, I got to the top in the end. There was a little parapet behind which I found space to lie down. Then I proceeded to go off into an old-fashioned swoon. I woke with a burning head and the sun glaring in my face. For a long time I lay motionless, for those horrible fumes seemed to have loosened my joints and dulled my brain. Sounds came to me from the house, 
men speaking throatily and the throbbing of a stationary car. There was a little gap in the parapet to which I wriggled, and from which I had some sort of prospect of the yard. I saw figures come out, a servant with his head bound up, and then a younger man in knickerbockers. They were looking for something, and moved towards the mill. Then one of them caught sight of the wisp of cloth on the nail, and cried out to the other. They both went back to the house, and brought two more to look at it. I saw the rotund figure of my late captor, and I thought I made out the man with the lisp. I noticed that all had pistols. For half an hour they ransacked the mill. I could hear them kicking over the barrels and pulling up the rotten planking. Then they came outside, and stood just below the dovecot, arguing fiercely. The servant with the bandage was being soundly rated. I heard them fiddling with the door of the dovecot, and for one horrid moment I fancied they were coming up. Then they thought better of it, and went back to the house. All that long, blistering afternoon I lay baking on the rooftop. Thirst was my chief torment. My tongue was like a stick, and to make it worse I could hear the cool drip of water from the mill aid. I watched the course of the little stream as it came in from the moor, and my fancy followed it up to the top of a glen, where it must issue from an icy fountain fringed with cool ferns and mosses. I would have given a thousand pounds to plunge my face into that. I had a fine prospect of the whole ring of moorland. I saw the car speed away with two occupants and a man on a hill pony riding east. I judged they were looking for me, and I wished them joy of their quest. But I saw something else more interesting. The house stood almost on the summit of a swell of moorland which crowned a sort of plateau, and there was no higher point nearer than the big hill six miles off. The actual summit, as I have mentioned, was a biggish clump of trees, firs mostly, with a few ashes and beeches. On the dovecote I was almost on a level with the tree tops, and could see what lay beyond. The wood was not solid, but only a ring, and inside was an oval of green turf, for all the world like a big cricket field. It didn't take long to guess what it was. It was an aerodrome, and a secret one. The place had been most cunningly chosen. For suppose anyone were watching an aeroplane descending here, he would think it had gone over the hill beyond the trees. As the place was on the top of a rise in the midst of a big amphitheater, any observer from any direction would conclude it had passed out of view behind the hill. Only a man very close at hand would realize that the aeroplane had not gone over, but had descended in the midst of the wood. An observer with a telescope on one of the higher hills might have discovered the truth, but only herds went there, and herds do not carry spy glasses. When I looked from the dovecote, I could see far away a blue line which I knew was the sea, and I grew furious to think that our enemies had this secret conning tower to rake our waterways. Then I reflected that if that aeroplane came back, the chances were ten to one that I would be discovered. So through the afternoon I lay and prayed for the coming of darkness, and glad I was when the sun went down over the big western hills and the twilight haze crept over the moor. The aeroplane was late. The gloaming was far advanced when I heard the beat of wings and saw it volplaning downward to its home in the wood. Lights twinkled for a bit, and there was much coming and going from the house. Then the dark fell, and silence. Thank God it was a black night. The moon was well on its last quarter and would not rise till late. My thirst was too great to allow me to tarry. So about nine o'clock, so far as I could judge, I started to descend. It wasn't easy, and halfway down I heard the back door of the house open, and saw the gleam of a lantern against the mill wall. 
For some agonizing minutes I hung by the ivy and prayed that whoever it was would not come round by the dovecot. Then the light disappeared, and I dropped as softly as I could onto the hard soil of the yard. I crawled on my belly in the lee of a stone dyke till I reached the fringe of trees which surrounded the house. If I had known how to do it, I would have tried to put that aeroplane out of action, but I realized that any attempt would probably be futile. I was pretty certain that there would be some kind of defense round the house, so I went through the wood on hands and knees, feeling carefully every inch before me. It was as well, for presently I came on a wire about two feet from the ground. If I had tripped over that, it would doubtless have rung some bell in the house, and I would have been captured. A hundred yards farther on I found another wire cunningly placed on the edge of a small stream. Beyond that lay the moor, and in five minutes I was deep in bracken and heather. Soon I was round the shoulder of the rise, and in the little glen from which the mill laid flowed. Ten minutes later my face was in the spring, and I was soaking down pints of the blessed water. But I did not stop till I had put half a dozen miles between me and that accursed dwelling. End of Section 6 Chapter 7 The Dry Fly Fisherman I sat down on a hilltop and took stock of my position. I wasn't feeling very happy, for my natural thankfulness at my escape was clouded by my severe bodily discomfort. Those lentitite fumes had fairly poisoned me, and the baking hours on the dovecot hadn't helped matters. I had a crushing headache and felt as sick as a cat. Also, my shoulder was in a bad way. At first I thought it was only a bruise but it seemed to be swelling, and I had no use of my left arm. My plan was to seek Mr. Turnbull's cottage, recover my garments, and especially Scudder's notebook, and then make for the main line and get back to the south. It seemed to me that the sooner I got in touch with the foreign office man, Sir Walter Bullivant, the better. I didn't see how I could get more proof than I had got already. He must just take or leave my story, and anyway, with him I would be in better hands than those devilish Germans. I had begun to feel quite kindly towards the British police. It was a wonderful starry night, and I had not much difficulty about the road. Sir Harry's map had given me the lie of the land, and all I had to do was to steer a point or two west of southwest to come to the stream where I had met the roadman. In all these travels I never knew the names of the places, but I believe this stream was no less than the upper waters of the River Tweed. I calculated I must be about eighteen miles distant, and that meant I could not get there before morning. So I must lie up a day somewhere, for I was too outrageous a figure to be seen in the sunlight. I had neither coat, waistcoat, collar, nor hat. My trousers were badly torn and my face and hands were black with the explosion. I dare say I had other beauties, for my eyes felt as if they were furiously bloodshot. Altogether I was no spectacle for God-fearing citizens to see on a high road. Very soon after daybreak I made an attempt to clean myself in a hill burn, and then approached a herd's cottage, for I was feeling the need of food. The herd was away from home, and his wife was alone, with no neighbor for five miles. She was a decent old body, and a plucky one, for though she got a fright when she saw me, she had an axe handy, and would have used it on any evil doer. I told her that I had had a fall, I didn't say how, and she saw by my looks that I was pretty sick. Like a true Samaritan, she asked no questions but gave me a bowl of milk with a dash of whiskey in it, and let me sit for a little by her kitchen fire. She would have bathed my shoulder, but it ached so badly I would not let her touch it. I don't know what she took me for, a repentant burglar, perhaps, 
for when I wanted to pay her for the milk and tendered a sovereign, which was the smallest coin I had, she shook her head and said something about giving it to them that had a right to it. At this I protested so strongly that I think she believed me honest, for she took the money and gave me a warm new plaid for it and an old hat of her man's. She showed me how to wrap the plaid around my shoulders, and when I left that cottage, I was the living image of the kind of Scotsman you see in the illustrations to Burns' poems. But at any rate, I was more or less clad. It was all as well, for the weather changed before midday to a thick drizzle of rain. I found shelter below an overhanging rock in the crook of a burn, where a drift of dead brackens made a tolerable bed. There I managed to sleep till nightfall, waking very cramped and wretched, with my shoulder gnawing like a toothache. I ate the oat cake and cheese the old wife had given me, and set out again just before the darkening. I pass over the miseries of that night among the wet hills. There were no stars to steer by, and I had to do the best I could from my memory of the map. Twice I lost my way, and I had some nasty falls into peat bogs. I had only about ten miles to go as the crow flies, but my mistakes made it nearer twenty. The last bit was completed with set teeth and a very light and dizzy head, but I managed it, and in the early dawn I was knocking at Mr. Turnbull's door. The mist lay close and thick, and from the cottage I could not see the high road. Mr. Turnbull himself opened to me, sober and something more than sober. He was primely dressed in an ancient but well-tended suit of black. He had been shaven not later than the night before. He wore a linen collar, and in his left hand he carried a pocket Bible. At first he did not recognize me. Who are ye that come stravagant here on the Sabbath morning? he asked. I had lost all count of the days, so the Sabbath was the reason for this strange decorum. My head was swimming so wildly that I could not frame a coherent answer, but he recognized me and he saw that I was ill. Hey, you got my specs? he asked. I fetched them out of my trouser pocket and gave him them. You'll have come for your jacket and waistcoat, he said. Come in by. Losh, man, you terrible done i the legs. Hot up till I get you to a chair. I perceived I was in for a bout of malaria. I had a good deal of fever in my bones, and the wet night had brought it out, while my shoulder and the effects of the fumes combined to make me feel pretty bad. Before I knew, Mr. Turnbull was helping me off with my clothes, and putting me to bed in one of the two cupboards that lined the kitchen walls. He was a true friend in need, that old roadman. His wife was dead years ago, and since his daughter's marriage he lived alone. For the better part of ten days he did all the rough nursing I needed. I simply wanted to be left in peace while the fever took its course and when my skin was cool again I found that the bout had more or less cured my shoulder. But it was a baddish go, and though I was out of bed in five days, it took me some time to get my legs again. He went out each morning, leaving me milk for the day and locking the door behind him, and came in in the evening to sit silent in the chimney corner. Not a soul came near the place, when I was getting better, he never bothered me with a question. Several times he fetched me a two-days-old Scotsman, and I noticed that the interest in the Portland Place murder seemed to have died down. There was no mention of it, and I could find very little about anything except a thing called the General Assembly, some ecclesiastical spree, I gathered. One day he produced my belt from a lock-fast drawer, there's a terrible heap of siller in it, he said. You'd better count it to see it's all there. He never even sought my name. I asked him if anybody had been around making inquiries subsequent to my spell at the road-making. 
Aye, there was a man in a motor car. He spired we had taken my place that day, and I let on I thought him daft. But he keep it on at me, and sign I said he mon be thinking, oh my God, brother, fray the clutch that whiles lent me a hon. He was a worse looking soul, and I could not understand the half o' his English tongue. I was getting restless those last days, and as soon as I felt myself fit, I decided to be off. That was not till the twelfth day of June, and as luck would have it, a drover went past that morning taking some cattle to Moffat. He was a man named Hislop, a friend of Turnbull's, and he came in to his breakfast with us and offered to take me with him. I made Turnbull accept five pounds for my lodging and a hard job I had of it. There never was a more independent being. He grew positively rude when I pressed him, and shy and red, and took the money at last without a thank you. When I told him how much I owed him, he grunted something about, I get turned deserving another. You would have thought from our leave-taking that we had parted in disgust. Hislop was a cheery soul, who chattered all the way over the pass and down the sunny Vale of Annan. I talked of Galloway markets and sheep prices, and he made up his mind I was a pack-shepherd from those parts, whatever that may be. My plaid and my old hat, as I have said, gave me a fine theatrical Scots look, but driving cattle is a mortally slow job, and we took the better part of the day to cover a dozen miles. If I had not had such an anxious heart, I would have enjoyed that time. It was shining blue weather, with a constantly changing prospect of brown hills and far green meadows, and a continual sound of larks and curlews and falling streams. But I had no mind for the summer, and little for Hislop's conversation, for as the fateful 15th of June drew near, I was overweighed with the hopeless difficulties of my enterprise. I got some dinner in a humble Moffat public house, and walked the two miles to the junction on the main line. The night express for the south was not due till near midnight, and to fill up the time I went up on the hillside and fell asleep, for the walk had tired me. I all but slept too long, and had to run to the station and catch the train with two minutes to spare. The feel of the hard third-class cushions and the smell of tobacco cheered me up wonderfully. At any rate, I felt now that I was getting to grips with my job. I was decanted at Crewe in the small hours, and had to wait till six to get a train for Birmingham. In the afternoon I got to Reading, and changed into a local train which journeyed into the deeps of Berkshire. Presently I was in a land of lush water meadows and slow reedy streams. About eight o'clock in the evening a weary and travel-stained being, a cross between a farm laborer and a vet, with a checked black and white plaid over his arm, for I did not dare to wear it south of the border, descended at the little station of Artinswell. There were several people on the platform, and I thought I had better wait to ask my way till I was clear of the place. The road led through a wood of great beeches and then into a shallow valley, with the green backs of downs peeping over the distant trees. After Scotland the air smelt heavy and flat, but infinitely sweet, for the limes and chestnuts and lilac bushes were domes of blossom. Presently I came to a bridge, below which a clear, slow stream flowed between snowy beds of water buttercups. A little above it was a mill, and the lasher made a pleasant, cool sound in the scented dusk. Somehow the place soothed me and put me at my ease. I fell to whistling as I looked into the green depths, and the tune which came to my lips was Annie Laurie. A fisherman came up from the waterside, and as he neared me he too began to whistle. The tune was infectious, for he followed my suit. 
He was a huge man in untidy old flannels and a wide-brimmed hat, with a canvas bag slung on his shoulder. He nodded to me, and I thought I had never seen a shrewder or better-tempered face. He leaned his delicate ten-foot split cane rod against the bridge and looked with me at the water. Clear, isn't it? he said pleasantly. I back our Kennet any day against the test. Look at that big fellow. Four pounds if he's an ounce, but the evening rise is over, and you can't tempt him. I don't see him, said I. Look there, a yard from the reeds just above that stickle. I've got him now. You might swear he was a black stone. So, he said, and whistled another bar of Annie Larry. Twisden's the name, isn't it? He said over his shoulder, his eyes still fixed on the stream. No, I said. I mean to say, yes. I had forgotten all about my alias. It's a wise conspirator that knows his own name, he observed, grinning broadly at a moor hen that emerged from the bridge's shadow. I stood up and looked at him at the square cleft jaw and broad, lined brow and the firm folds of cheek, and began to think that here, at last, was an ally worth having. His whimsical blue eyes seemed to go very deep. Suddenly he frowned. I call it disgraceful, he said, raising his voice, disgraceful that an able-bodied man like you should dare to beg. You can get a meal from my kitchen, but you'll get no money from me. A dog-cart was passing, driven by a young man who raised his whip to salute the fisherman. When he had gone, he picked up his rod. That's my house, he said, pointing to a white gate a hundred yards on. Wait five minutes and then go round to the back door. And with that, he left me. I did as I was bidden. I found a pretty cottage with a lawn running down to the stream, and a perfect jungle of gilder rose and lilac flanking the path. The back door stood open, and a grave butler was awaiting me. Come this way, sir, he said, and he led me along a passage and up a back staircase to a pleasant bedroom looking towards the river. There I found a complete outfit laid out for me, dress clothes with all the fixings, a brown flannel suit, shirts, collars, ties, shaving things and hair brushes, even a pair of patent shoes. Sir Walter thought as how Mr. Reggie's things would fit you, sir, said the butler. He keeps some clothes here, for he comes regular on the weekends. There's a bathroom next door, and I've prepared a hot bath. Dinner in half an hour, sir. You'll hear the gong. The grave being withdrew, and I sat down in a shins-covered easy chair and gaped. It was like a pantomime to come suddenly out of beggardom into this orderly comfort. Obviously Sir Walter believed in me, though why he did I could not guess. I looked at myself in the mirror and saw a wild, haggard brown fellow, with a fortnight's ragged beard and dust in ears and eyes, collarless, vulgarly shirted, with shapeless old tweed clothes and boots that had not been cleaned for the better part of a month. I made a fine tramp and a fair drover, and here I was, ushered by a prim butler into this temple of gracious ease and the best of it was that they did not even know my name. I resolved not to puzzle my head, but to take the gifts the gods had provided. I shaved and bathed luxuriously, and got into the dress clothes and clean, crackling shirt, which fitted me not so badly. By the time I had finished, the looking-glass showed a not unpersonable young man, Sir Walter awaited me in a dusky dining room where a little round table was lit with silver candles. The sight of him, 
so respectable and established and secure, the embodiment of law and government and all the conventions, took me aback and made me feel an interloper. He couldn't know the truth about me, or he wouldn't treat me like this. I simply could not accept his hospitality on false pretenses. I'm more obliged to you than I can say, but I'm bound to make things clear, I said. I'm an innocent man, but I'm wanted by the police. I've got to tell you this, and I won't be surprised if you kick me out. He smiled. That's all right. Don't let that interfere with your appetite. We can talk about these things after dinner. I never ate a meal with greater relish, for I had had nothing all day but railway sandwiches. Sir Walter did me proud, for we drank a good champagne and had some uncommon fine port afterwards. It made me almost hysterical to be sitting there, waited on by a footman and a sleek butler, and remember that I had been living for three weeks like a brigand, with every man's hand against me. I told Sir Walter about tigerfish in the Zambezi that bite off your fingers if you give them a chance, and we discussed sport up and down the globe, for he had hunted a bit in his day. We went to his study for coffee, a jolly room full of books and trophies and untidiness and comfort. I made up my mind that if ever I got rid of this business and had a house of my own, I would create such a room. Then, when the coffee cups were cleared away, and we had got our cigars lit, my host swung his long legs over the side of his chair and bade me get started with my yarn. I've obeyed Harry's instructions, he said, and the bribe he offered me was that you would tell me something to wake me up. I'm ready, Mr. Hannay. I noticed with a start that he called me by my proper name. I began at the very beginning. I told of my boredom in London, and the night I had come back to find Scudder gibbering on my doorstep. I told him all Scudder had told me about Carolides and the Foreign Office Conference, and that made him purse his lips and grin. Then I got to the murder, and he grew solemn again. He heard all about the milkman and my time in Galloway, and my deciphering Scudder's notes at the inn. You've got them here? he asked sharply, and drew a long breath when I whipped the little book from my pocket. I said nothing of the contents. Then I described my meeting with Sir Harry and the speeches at the hall. At that he laughed uproariously. Harry talked dash nonsense, did he? I quite believe it. He's as good a chap as ever breathed, but his idiot of an uncle has stuffed his head with maggots. Go on, Mr. Hannay. My day as a roadman excited him a bit. He made me describe the two fellows in the car very closely, and seemed to be raking back in his memory. He grew merry again when he heard of the fate of that ass Jopley. But the old man in the moorland house solemnized him. Again I had to describe every detail of his appearance. Bland and bald-headed and hooded his eyes like a bird. He sounds like a sinister wild fowl. And you dynamited his hermitage after he saved you from the police. Spirited piece of work, that. Presently I reached the end of my wanderings. He got up slowly and looked down at me from the hearth rug. You may dismiss the police from your mind, he said. You're in no danger from the law of this land. Great Scott, I cried. Have they got the murderer? No. But for the last fortnight they have dropped you from the list of possibles. Why? I asked in amazement. Principally because I received a letter from Scudder. I knew something of the man, and he did several jobs for me. He was half crank, half genius, but he was wholly honest. The trouble about him was his partiality for playing a lone hand. 
That made him pretty well useless in any secret service. A pity, for he had uncommon gifts. I think he was the bravest man in the world, for he was always shivering with fright, and yet nothing would choke him off. I had a letter from him on the 31st of May, but he had been dead a week by then. The letter was written and posted on the 23rd. He evidently did not anticipate his immediate decease. His communications usually took a week to reach me, for they were sent under cover to Spain and then to Newcastle. He had a mania, you know, for concealing his tracks. What did he say? I stammered. Nothing. Merely that he was in danger, but had found shelter with a good friend, and I would hear from him before the 15th of June. He gave me no address, but he said he was living near Portland Place. I think his object was clear to you if anything happened. When I got it, I went to Scotland Yard, went over the details of the inquest, and concluded that you were the friend. We made inquiries about you, Mr. Hannay, and found you were respectable. I thought I knew the motives for your disappearance, not only the police, the other one, too, and when I got Harry's scrawl, I guessed at the rest. I've been expecting you any time this past week. You can imagine what a load this took off my mind. I felt a free man once more for I was now up against my country's enemies only, and not my country's law. Now let us have the little notebook, said Sir Walter. It took us a good hour to work through it. I explained the cipher, and he was jolly quick at picking it up. He amended my reading of it on several points, but I had been fairly correct on the whole. His face was very grave before he had finished, and he sat silent for a while. I don't know what to make of it, he said at last. He is right about one thing, what is going to happen the day after tomorrow. How the devil can it have got known? That is ugly enough in itself, but all this about war and the black stone... It reads like some wild melodrama. If only I had more confidence in Scudder's judgment. The trouble about him was that he was too romantic. He had the artistic temperament and wanted a story to be better than God meant it to be. He had a lot of odd biases, too. Jews, for example, made him see red. Jews and the high finance... The black stone, he repeated, der Schwarz Stein. It's like a penny novelette, and all this stuff about Corollides. That is the weak part of the tale, for I happen to know that the virtuous Corollides is likely to outlast us both. There is no state in Europe that wants him gone. Besides, he has just been playing up to Berlin and Vienna, and giving my chief some uneasy moments. No. Scudder has gone off the track there. Frankly, Hannay, I don't believe that part of the story. There's some nasty business afoot, and he found out too much and lost his life over it. But I am ready to take my oath that it is ordinary spy work. A certain great European power makes a hobby of her spy system, and her methods are not too particular. Since she pays by piecework, her blackguards are not likely to stick at a murder or two. They want our naval dispositions for their collection at the Marine Amt, but they will be pigeonholed, nothing more. Just then the butler entered the room. There's a trunk call from London, Sir Walter. It's Mr. Reith, and he wants to speak to you personally. My host went off to the telephone. He returned in five minutes with a whitish face. I apologize to the shade of Scudder, he said. 
Carolides was shot dead this evening at a few minutes after seven. End of section seven. Chapter eight, the coming of the black stone. I came down to breakfast the next morning after eight hours of blessed dreamless sleep to find Sir Walter decoding a telegram in the midst of muffins and marmalade. His fresh rosiness of yesterday seemed a thought tarnished. I had a busy hour on the telephone after you went to bed, he said. I got my chief to speak to the First Lord and the Secretary of War, and they are bringing Royer over a day sooner. This wire clinches it. He will be in London at five. Odd that the code word for a sous chef d'etat major general should be Polka. He directed me to the hot dishes and went on. Not that I think it will do much good. If your friends were clever enough to find out the first arrangement, they are clever enough to discover the change. I would give my head to know where the leak is. We believed there were only five men in England who knew about Royer's visit, and you may be certain there were fewer in France, for they managed these things better there. While I ate, he continued to talk, making me to my surprise a present of his full confidence. Can the dispositions not be changed? I asked. They could, he said. But we want to avoid that, if possible. They are the result of a mince thought, and no alteration would be as good. Besides, on one or two points, change is simply impossible. Still, something could be done, I suppose, if it were absolutely necessary. But you see the difficulty, Henny. Our enemies are not going to be such fools as to pick Royer's pocket or any childish game like that. They know that would mean a row and put us on our guard. Their aim is to get the details without any one of us knowing, so that Royer will go back to Paris in the belief that the whole business is still deadly secret. If they can't do that, they fail, for once we suspect, they know that the whole thing must be altered. Then we must stick by the Frenchman's side till he is home again, I said. If they thought they could get the information in Paris, they would try there. It means they have some deep scheme on foot in London, which they reckon is going to win out. Royer dines with my chief and then comes to my house where four people will see him, Whitaker from the Admiralty, myself, Sir Arthur Drew and General Winstonley. The First Lord is ill and has gone to Shermingham. At my house he will get a certain document from Whitaker, and after that he will be motored to Portsmouth, where a destroyer will take him to Havre. His journey is too important for the ordinary boat train. He will never be left unattended for a moment till he is safe on French soil. The same with Whitaker till he meets Royer. That is the best we can do, and it's hard to see how there can be any miscarriage but I don't mind admitting that I'm horribly nervous. This murder of Carolides will play the deuce in the chancelleries of Europe. After breakfast, he asked me if I could drive a car. Well, you'll be my chauffeur today and wear Hudson's rig. You're about his size. You have a hand in this business and we are taking no risks. There are desperate men against us who will not respect the country retreat of an overworked official. When I first came to London, I had bought a car and amused myself with running about the south of England, so I knew something of the geography. I took Sir Walter to town by the Bath Road and made good going. It was a soft, breathless June morning with a promise of sultriness later but it was delicious enough swinging through the little towns with their freshly watered streets and past the summer gardens of the Thames Valley. I landed Sir Walter at his house in Queen Anne's Gate punctually by half past eleven. The butler was coming up by train with the luggage. The 
first thing he did was to take me round to Scotland Yard. There we saw a prim gentleman with a clean-shaven lawyer's face. I've brought you the Portland Place murderer, was Sir Walter's introduction. The reply was a wry smile. It would have been a welcome present, Wellivant. This, I presume, is Mr. Richard Hannay, who for some days greatly interested my department. Mr. Hannay will interest it again. He has much to tell you, but not today. For certain grave reasons, his tale must wait for four hours. Then, I can promise you, he will be entertained and possibly edified. I want you to assure Mr. Hannay that he will suffer no further inconvenience. This assurance was promptly given. You can take up your life where you left off, I was told. Your flat, which probably you no longer wish to occupy, is waiting for you, and your man is still there. As you were never publicly accused, we considered that there was no need of a public exculpation. But on that, of course, you must please yourself. We may want your assistance later on, McAlifray, Sir Walter said as we left. Then he turned me loose. Come and see me tomorrow, Hannay. I needn't tell you to keep deadly quiet. If I were you, I would go to bed, for you must have considerable arrears of sleep to overtake. You had better lie low, for if one of your black stone friends saw you, there might be trouble. I felt curiously at a loose end. At first it was very pleasant to be a free man, able to go where I wanted without fearing anything. I had only been a month under the ban of the law, and it was quite enough for me. I went to the Savoy and ordered very carefully a very good luncheon, and then smoked the best cigar the house could provide. But I was still feeling nervous. When I saw anybody looking at me in the lounge, I grew shy and wondered if they were thinking about the murder. After that I took a taxi and drove miles away up into North London. I walked back through fields and lines of villas and terraces and then slums and mean streets, and it took me pretty nearly two hours. All the while my restlessness was growing worse. I felt that great things, tremendous things, were happening or about to happen, and I, who was the cogwheel of the whole business, was out of it. Royer would be landing at Dover, Sir Walter would be making plans with the few people in England who were in the secret, and somewhere in the darkness the black stone would be working. I felt the sense of danger and impending calamity, and I had the curious feeling, too, that I alone could avert it, alone could grapple with it, but I was out of the game now. How could it be otherwise? It was not likely that cabinet ministers and admiralty lords and generals would admit me to their councils. I actually began to wish that I could run up against one of my three enemies. That would lead to developments. I felt that I wanted enormously to have a vulgar scrap with those gentry, where I could hit out and flatten something. I was rapidly getting into a very bad temper. I didn't feel like going back to my flat. That had to be faced some time, but as I still had sufficient money, I thought I would put it off till next morning and go to a hotel for the night. My irritation lasted through dinner, which I had at a restaurant in German Street. I was no longer hungry and let several courses pass untasted. I drank the best part of a bottle of Burgundy, but it did nothing to cheer me. An abominable restlessness had taken possession of me. Here was I, a very ordinary fellow, with no particular brains, and yet I was convinced that somehow I was needed to help this business through, that without me it would all go to blazes. I told myself it was sheer silly conceit that four or five of the cleverest people living, with all the might of the British Empire at their back, had the job in hand. 
yet I couldn't be convinced. It seemed as if a voice kept speaking in my ear, telling me to be up and doing, or I would never sleep again. The upshot was that about half past nine I made up my mind to go to Queen Anne's Gate. Very likely I would not be admitted, but it would ease my conscience to try. I walked down German Street, and at the corner of Duke Street passed a group of young men. They were in evening dress, had been dining somewhere, and were going on to a music hall. One of them was Mr. Marmaduke Jopley. He saw me and stopped short. By God, the murderer! he cried. Here, you fellows, hold him! That's Henney, the man who did the Portman Place murder! He gripped me by the arm and the others crowded round. I wasn't looking for any trouble, but my ill temper made me play the fool. A policeman came up, and I should have told him the truth, and if he didn't believe it, demanded to be taken to Scotland Yard, or, for that matter, to the nearest police station. But a delay at that moment seemed to me unendurable, and the sight of Marmy's imbecile face was more than I could bear. I let out with my left, and had the satisfaction of seeing him measure his length in the gutter. Then began an unholy row. They were all on me at once, and the policemen took me in the rear. I got in one or two good blows, for, I think, with fair play, I could have licked the lot of them. But the policemen pinned me behind, and one of them got his fingers on my throat. Through a black cloud of rage I heard the officer of the law asking what was the matter, and Marmy, between his broken teeth, declaring that I was Hanny the murderer. Oh, damn it all! I cried. Make the fellow shut up. I advise you to leave me alone, constable. Scotland Yard knows all about me, and you'll get a proper wigging if you interfere with me. You've got to come along with me, young man said the policeman. I saw you strike that gentleman cruel hard. You began it too, for he wasn't doing nothing. I seen you. Let's go quietly or I'll have to fix you up. Exasperation and an overwhelming sense that at no cost must I delay gave me the strength of a bull elephant. I fairly wrenched the constable off his feet, floored the man who was gripping my collar, and set off at my best pace down Duke Street. I heard a whistle being blown and the rush of men behind me. I have a very fair turn of speed, and that night I had wings. In a jiffy I was in Paul Mall and had turned down towards St. James Park. I dodged the policemen at the palace gates, dived through a press of carriages at the entrance to the mall, and was making for the bridge before my pursuers had crossed the roadway. In the open ways of the park I put on a spurt. Happily there were few people about and no one tried to stop me. I was staking all on getting to Queen Anne's Gate. When I entered that quiet thoroughfare it seemed deserted. Sir Walter's house was in the narrow part, and outside it three or four motor cars were drawn up. I slackened speed some yards off and walked briskly up to the door. If the butler refused me admission, or if he even delayed to open the door, I was done. He didn't delay. I had scarcely rung before the door opened. I must see Sir Walter, I panted. My business is desperately important. That butler was a great man. Without moving a muscle, he held the door open, and then shut it behind me. Sir Walter is engaged, sir, and I have orders to admit no one. Perhaps you will wait. The house was of the old-fashioned kind, with a wide hall and rooms on both sides of it. At the far end was an alcove with a telephone and a couple of chairs, and there the butler offered me a seat. See here, I whispered. There's trouble about, and I'm in it, but Sir Walter knows, and I'm working for him. If anyone comes and asks if I'm here, tell him a lie. He nodded, and presently there was a noise of voices in the street, 
and a furious ringing at the bell. I never admired a man more than that butler. He opened the door and, with a face like a graven image, waited to be questioned. Then he gave them it. He told them whose house it was and what his orders were, and simply froze them off the doorstep. I could see it all from my alcove, and it was better than any play. I hadn't waited long till there came another ring at the bell. The butler made no bones about admitting this new visitor. While he was taking off his coat, I saw who it was. You couldn't open a newspaper or a magazine without seeing that face. The grey beard cut like a spade, the firm fighting mouth, the blunt square nose, and the keen blue eyes. I recognized the first sea lord, the man, they say, that made the new British Navy. He passed my alcove and was ushered into a room at the back of the hall. As the door opened, I could hear the sound of low voices. It shut, and I was left alone again. For twenty minutes I sat there, wondering what I was to do next. I was still perfectly convinced that I was wanted, but when or how I had no notion. I kept looking at my watch, and as the time crept on to half-past ten, I began to think that the conference must soon end. In a quarter of an hour, Royer should be speeding along the road to Portsmouth. Then I heard a bell ring, and the butler appeared. The door of the back room opened, and the first sea lord came out. He walked past me, and in passing, he glanced in my direction, and for a second we looked each other in the face. Only for a second, but it was enough to make my heart jump. I had never seen the great man before, and he had never seen me, but in that fraction of time something sprang into his eyes, and that something was recognition. You can't mistake it. It is a flicker, a spark of light, a minute shade of difference, which means one thing, and one thing only. It came involuntarily, for in a moment it died, and he passed on. In a maze of wild fancies, I heard the street door close behind him. I picked up the telephone book and looked up the number of his house. We were connected at once, and I heard a servant's voice. Is his lordship at home? I asked. His lordship returned half an hour ago, said the voice, and has gone to bed. He is not very well tonight. Will you leave a message, sir? I rang off and almost tumbled into a chair. My part in this business was not yet ended. It had been a close shave, but I had been in time. Not a moment could be lost, so I marched boldly to the door of that back room and entered without knocking. Five surprised faces looked up from a round table. There was Sir Walter and Drew, the war minister, whom I knew from his photographs. There was a slim elderly man who was probably Whitaker, the Admiralty official. And there was General Winstonley, conspicuous from the long scar on his forehead. Lastly, there was a short, stout man with an iron grey moustache and bushy eyebrows, who had been arrested in the middle of a sentence. Sir Walter's face showed surprise and annoyance. This is Mr. Hannay, of whom I have spoken to you, he said apologetically to the company. I'm afraid, Mr. Hannay, this visit is ill-timed. I was getting back my coolness. That remains to be seen, sir, I said, but I think it may be in the nick of time. For God's sake, gentlemen, tell me who went out a minute ago. Lord Aloa, Sir Walter said, reddening with anger. It was not, I cried. It was his living image, but it was not Lord Aloa. It was someone who recognized me, someone I have seen in the last month. He had scarcely left the doorstep when I rang up Lord Aloa's house and was told he had come in half an hour before and had gone to bed. Who, who, someone stammered. The Black Stone, I cried, and I sat down in the chair so recently vacated and looked round at five badly scared gentlemen. End of section 8
Chapter 9 The 39 Steps Nonsense, said the official from the Admiralty. Sir Walter got up and left the room while we looked blankly at the table. He came back in ten minutes with a long face. I have spoken to Aloha, he said. Had him out of bed, very grumpy. He went straight home after Mulross's dinner. But it's madness, broke in General Winstonley. Do you mean to tell me that that man came here and sat beside me for the best part of half an hour, and that I didn't detect the imposture? Aloha must be out of his mind. Don't you see the cleverness of it? I said. You were too interested in other things to have any eyes. You took Lord Aloha for granted. If it had been anybody else, you might have looked more closely. But it was natural for him to be here, and that put you all to sleep. Then the Frenchman spoke, very slowly and in good English. The young man is right. His psychology is good. Our enemies have not been foolish. He bent his wise brows on the assembly. I will tell you a tale, he said. It happened many years ago in Senegal. I was quartered in a remote station, and to pass the time I used to go fishing for big barbel in the river. A little Arab mare used to carry my luncheon basket, one of the salted dun breed you got at Timbuktu in the old days. Well, one morning I had good sport, and the mare was unaccountably restless. I could hear her whinnying and squealing and stamping her feet and I kept soothing her with my voice while my mind was intent on fish. I could see her all the time, as I thought, out of a corner of my eye tethered to a tree twenty yards away. After a couple of hours I began to think of food. I collected my fish in a tarpaulin bag and moved down the stream towards the mare, trolling my line. When I got up to her, I flung the tarpaulin on her back, he paused and looked around. It was the smell that gave me warning. I turned my head and found myself looking at a lion three feet off, an old man-eater. That was the terror of the village. What was left of the mare, a mass of blood and bones and hide, was behind him. What happened? I asked. I was enough of a hunter to know a true yarn when I heard it. I stuffed my fishing rod into his jaws, and I had a pistol. Also my servants came presently with rifles, but he left his mark on me. He held up a hand which lacked three fingers. Consider, he said, the mare had been dead more than an hour, and the brute had been patiently watching me ever since. I never saw the kill, for I was accustomed to the mare's fretting and I never marked her absence, for my consciousness of her was only of something tawny, and the lion filled that part. If I could blunder thus, gentlemen, in a land where men's senses are keen, why should we be busy preoccupied urban folk, not air also? Sir Walter nodded. No one was ready to gainsay him. But I don't see went on Winstonly. Their object was to get these dispositions without our knowing it. Now it only required one of us to mention to Aloha our meeting tonight, for the whole fraud to be exposed. Sir Walter laughed dryly. The selection of Aloha shows their acumen. Which of us was likely to speak to him about tonight, or was he likely to open the subject? I remembered the first sea lord's reputation for taciturnity and shortness of temper. The one thing that puzzles me, said the general, is what good his visit here would do that spy fellow. He could not carry away several pages of figures and strange names in his head. That is not difficult, the Frenchman replied. A good spy is trained to have a photographic memory like your own Macaulay. You noticed he said nothing, 
but went through these papers again and again. I think we may assume that he has every detail stamped on his mind. When I was younger, I could do the same trick. Well, I suppose there is nothing for it but to change the plans, said Sir Walter ruefully. Whitaker was looking very glum. Did you tell Lord Aloha what has happened? he asked. No? Well, I can't speak with absolute assurance, but I'm nearly certain we can't make any serious change unless we alter the geography of England. Another thing must be said. It was Royer who spoke. I talked freely when that man was here. I told something of the military plans of my government. I was permitted to say so much. But that information would be worth many millions to our enemies. No, my friends, I see no other way. The man who came here and his confederates must be taken, and taken at once. Good God! I cried. And we have not a rag of a clue. Besides, said Sir Whitaker, there is a post. By this time the news will be on its way. No, said the Frenchman. You do not understand the habits of the spy. He receives personally his reward, and he delivers personally his intelligence. We in France know something of the breed. There is still a chance, mes amis. These men must cross the sea, and there are ships to be searched and ports to be watched. Believe me, the need is desperate for both France and Britain. Royer's grave good sense seemed to pull us together. He was the man of action among fumblers. But I saw no hope in his face, and I felt none. Where among the fifty millions of these islands, and within a dozen hours, were we to lay hands on the three cleverest rogues in Europe? Then I suddenly had an inspiration. Where is Scudder's book? I cried to Sir Walter. Quick, man, I remember something in it. He unlocked the door of a bureau and gave it to me. I found the place. Thirty-nine steps. I read, and again, thirty-nine steps. I counted them, high tide, 10.17 p.m. The Admiralty man was looking at me as if he thought I had gone mad. Don't you see it's a clue? I shouted. Scudder knew where these fellows laired. He knew where they were going to leave the country, though he kept the name to himself. Tomorrow was the day and it was some place where high tide was at 10.17. They may have gone tonight, someone said. Not they. They have their own snug, secret way, and they won't be hurried. I know Germans, and they are mad about working to a plan. Where the devil can I get a book of tide tables? Whitaker brightened up. It's a chance, he said. Let's go over to the Admiralty. We got into two of the waiting motor cars, all but Sir Walter, who went off to Scotland Yard to mobilize McGallivray, so he said. We marched through empty corridors and big chambers where the charwomen were busy, till we reached a little room lined with books and maps. A resident clerk was unearthed, who presently fetched from the library the Admiralty tide tables. I sat at the desk and the others stood round, for somehow or other I had got charge of this expedition. It was no good. There were hundreds of entries, and so far as I could see, 1017 might cover 50 places. We had to find some way of narrowing the possibilities. I took my head in my hands and thought, there must be some way of reading this riddle. What did Scudder mean by steps? I thought of Doc's steps, but if he had meant that, I didn't think he would have mentioned the number. It must be some place where there were several staircases, and one marked out from the others by having thirty-nine steps. 
Then I had a sudden thought and hunted up all the steamer sailings. There was no boat which left for the continent at 10.17 p.m. Why was high tide so important? If it was a harbor, it must be some little place where the tide mattered, or else it was a heavy draft boat. But there was no regular steamer sailing at that hour, and somehow I didn't think they would travel by a big boat from a regular harbor. So it must be some little harbor where the tide was important, or perhaps no harbor at all. But if it was a little port, I couldn't see what the steps signified. There were no sets of staircases on any harbor that I had ever seen. It must be some place which a particular staircase identified and where the tide was full at 1017. On the whole, it seemed to me that the place must be a bit of open coast, but the staircases kept puzzling me. Then I went back to wider considerations. Whereabouts would a man be likely to leave for Germany, a man in a hurry, who wanted a speedy and secret passage? Not from any of the big harbors, and not from the Channel or the West Coast or Scotland, for remember, he was starting from London. I measured the distance on the map and tried to put myself in the enemy's shoes. I should try for Ostend or Antwerp or Rotterdam, and I should sail from somewhere on the east coast between Cromer and Dover. All of this was very loose guessing, and I don't pretend it was ingenious or scientific. I wasn't any kind of Sherlock Holmes. But I have always fancied I had a kind of instinct about questions like this. I don't know if I can explain myself, but I used to use my brains as far as they went, and after they came to a blank wall, I guessed. And I usually found my guesses pretty right. So I set out all my conclusions on a bit of admiralty paper. They ran like this. Fairly certain. One. Placed where there are several sets of stairs, one that matters distinguished by having thirty-nine steps. Two. Full tide at 10.17 p.m. Leaving shore only possible at full tide. Three. Steps, not dock steps, and so place probably not harbor. 4. No regular night steamer at 1017. Means of transport must be tramp, unlikely, yacht or fishing boat. There my reasoning stopped. I made another list which I headed guessed, but I was just as sure of the one as the other. Guessed, one place not harbor, but open coast. 2. Boat, small, trawler, yacht, or launch. 3. Place somewhere on the east coast between Cromer and Dover. It struck me as odd I should be sitting at that desk with a cabinet minister, a field marshal, two high government officials, and a French general watching me, while from the scribble of a dead man I was trying to drag a secret which meant life or death for us. Sir Walter had joined us, and presently McGallivray arrived. He had sent out instructions to watch the ports and railway stations for the three men whom I had described to Sir Walter. Not that he or anybody else thought that that would do much good. Here's the most I can make of it, I said. We've got to find a place where there are several staircases down to the beach one of which has 39 steps. I think it's a piece of open coast with biggish cliffs, somewhere between the wash and the channel. Also, it's a place where full tide is at 10.17 tomorrow night. Then an idea struck me. Is there no inspector of coast guards or some fellow like that who knows the east coast? Whitaker said there was, and that he lived in Clapham. He went off in a car to fetch him, and the rest of us sat about the little room and talked of anything that came into our heads. I lit a pipe and went over the whole thing again till my brain grew weary. About one in the morning the Coast Guard man arrived. He was a fine old fellow with the look of a naval officer and was desperately respectful to the company. 
I left the war minister to cross-examine him, for I felt he would think it cheek in me to talk. We want you to tell us the places you know on the east coast where there are cliffs and where several sets of steps run down to the beach. He thought for a bit. What kind of steps do you mean, sir? There are plenty of places with roads cut down through the cliffs, and most roads have a step or two in them. Or do you mean regular staircases, all steps, so to speak? Sir Arthur looked towards me. We mean regular staircases, I said. He reflected a minute or two. I don't know that I can think of any. Wait a second. There's a place in Norfolk, Brattlesham, beside a golf course, where there are a couple of staircases to let the gentleman get a loose ball. That's not it, I said. Then there are plenty of marine parades, if that's what you mean. Every seaside resort has them. I shook my head. It's got to be more retired than that, I said. Well, gentlemen, I can't think of anywhere else. Of course there's the rough. What's that? I asked. The big chalk headland in Kent, close to Bradgate. It's got a lot of villas on the top, and some of the houses have staircases down to a private beach. It's a very high-toned sort of place, and the residents there like to keep by themselves. I tore open the tide tables and found Bradgate. High tide there was at 10.27 p.m. on the 15th of June. We're on the scent at last, I cried excitedly. How can I find out what is the tide at the rough? I can tell you that, sir, said the Coast Guard man. I was once lent a house there in this very month, and I used to go out at night to the deep sea fishing. The tide's ten minutes before Bradgate. I closed the book and looked round at the company. If one of those staircases has thirty-nine steps, we have solved the mystery, gentlemen, I said. I want the loan of your car, Sir Walter, and a map of the roads. If Mr. McAlevery will spare me ten minutes, I think we can prepare something for tomorrow. It was ridiculous in me to take charge of the business like this, but they didn't seem to mind. And after all, I had been in the show from the start. Besides, I was used to rough jobs, and these eminent gentlemen were too clever not to see it. It was General Royer who gave me my commission. I, for one, he said, am content to leave the matter in Mr. Anne's hands. By half past three I was tearing past the moonlit hedgerows of Kent, with McGallivray's best man on the seat beside me. End of section nine. Chapter 10 Various Parties Converging on the Sea A pink and blue June morning found me at Bradgate, looking from the Griffin Hotel over a smooth sea to the light ship on the cock sands which seemed the size of a bell buoy. A couple of miles farther south and much nearer the shore, a small destroyer was anchored. Scaife, McAlvery's man who had been in the Navy, knew the boat and told me her name and her commanders, so I sent off a wire to Sir Walter. After breakfast, Scaife got from a house agent a key for the gates of the staircases on the rough. I walked with him along the sands and sat down in a nook of the cliffs while he investigated the half dozen of them. I didn't want to be seen, but the place at this hour was quite deserted, and all the time I was on that beach I saw nothing but the seagulls. It took him more than an hour to do the job, and when I saw him coming towards me, conning a bit of paper, I can tell you my heart was in my mouth. Everything depended, you see, on my guess proving right. He read aloud the number of steps in the different stairs. Thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-nine, forty-two, forty-seven, and twenty-one, where the cliffs grew lower. I almost got up and shouted. We hurried back to the town and sent a wire to McAlvery. 
I wanted half a dozen men, and I directed them to divide themselves among different specified hotels. Then Scaife set out to prospect the house at the head of the 39 steps. He came back with news that both puzzled and reassured me. The house was called Trafalgar Lodge and belonged to an old gentleman called Appleton, a retired stockbroker, the house agent said. Mr. Appleton was there a good deal in the summertime and was in residence now, had been for the better part of a week. Scaife could pick up very little information about him except that he was a decent old fellow who paid his bills regularly and was always good for a fiver for local charity. Then Scaife seemed to have penetrated to the back door of the house, pretending he was an agent for sewing machines. Only three servants were kept, a cook, a parlor maid, and a housemaid, and they were just the sort that you find in a respectable middle-class household. The cook was not the gossiping kind and had pretty soon shut the door in his face. But Scaife said he was positive she knew nothing. Next door there was a new house building which would give a good cover for observation, and the villa on the other side was to let, and its garden was rough and shrubby. I borrowed Scaife's telescope and before lunch went for a walk along the rough. I kept well behind the rows of villas and found a good observation point on the edge of the golf course. There I had a view of the line of turf along the cliff top, with seats placed at intervals and the little square plots railed in and planted with bushes, whence the staircases descended to the beach. I saw Trafalgar Lodge very plainly, a red brick villa with a veranda, a tennis lawn behind, and in front the ordinary seaside flower garden full of marguerites and scraggy geraniums. There was a flagstaff from which an enormous Union Jack hung limply in the still air. Presently I observed someone leave the house and saunter along the cliff. When I got my glasses on him, I saw it was an old man wearing white flannel trousers, a blue serge jacket, and a straw hat. He carried field glasses and a newspaper and sat down on one of the iron seats and began to read. Sometimes he would lay down the paper and turn his glasses on the sea. He looked for a long time at the destroyer. I watched him for half an hour till he got up and went back to the house for his luncheon when I returned to the hotel for mine. I wasn't feeling very confident. This decent, commonplace dwelling was not what I had expected. The man might be the bald archaeologist of that horrible moorland farm or he might not. He was exactly the kind of satisfied old bird you will find in every suburb and every holiday place. If you wanted a type of the perfectly harmless person, you would probably pitch on that. But after lunch, as I sat in the hotel porch, I perked up, for I saw the thing I had hoped for and dreaded to miss. A yacht came up from the south and dropped anchor pretty well opposite the rough. She seemed about a hundred and fifty tons, and I saw she belonged to the squadron from the White Ensign. So Scaife and I went down to the harbor and hired a boatman for an afternoon's fishing. I spent a warm and peaceful afternoon. We caught between us about twenty pounds of cod and lithe, and out in the dancing blue sea I took a cheerier view of things. Above the white cliffs of the rough I saw the green and red of the villas, and especially the great flagstaff of Trafalgar Lodge. About four o'clock, when we had fished enough, I made the boatman row us round the yacht, which lay like a delicate white bird, ready at a moment to flee. Scaife said she must be a fast boat for her build and that she was pretty heavily engined. Her name was the Ariadne as I discovered from the cap of one of the men who was polishing brass work. I spoke to him and got an answer in the soft dialect of Essex. Another hand that came along passed me the time of day in an unmistakable English tongue. Our boatman had an argument with one of them about the weather, and for a few minutes we lay on our oars close to the starboard bow. 
Then the men suddenly disregarded us and bent their heads to their work as an officer came along the deck. He was a pleasant, clean-looking young fellow, and he put a question to us about our fishing in very good English. But there could be no doubt about him. His close-cropped head and the cut of his collar and tie never came out of England. That did something to reassure me. But as we rode back to Bradgate, my obstinate doubts would not be dismissed. The thing that worried me was the reflection that my enemies knew that I had got my knowledge from Scudder, and it was Scudder who had given me the clue to this place. If they knew that Scudder had this clue, would they not be certain to change their plans? Too much depended on their success for them to take any risks. The whole question was how much they understood about Scudder's knowledge. I had talked confidently last night about Germans always sticking to a scheme. But if they had any suspicions that I was on their track, they would be fools not to cover it. I wondered if the man last night had seen that I recognized him. Somehow I did not think that he had, and to that I had clung. But the whole business had never seemed so difficult as that afternoon, when by all calculations I should have been rejoicing in assured success. In the hotel I met the commander of the destroyer, to whom Scaife introduced me, and with whom I had a few words. Then I thought I would put an hour or two watching Trafalgar Lodge. I found a place farther up the hill in the garden of an empty house. From there I had a full view of the court, on which two figures were having a game of tennis. One was the old man, whom I had already seen, the other was a younger fellow, wearing some club colors and the scarf round his middle. They played with tremendous zest, like two city gents who wanted hard exercise to open their pores. You couldn't conceive a more innocent spectacle. They shouted and laughed and stopped for drinks when a maid brought out two tankards on a salver. I rubbed my eyes and asked myself if I was not the most immortal fool on earth. Mystery and darkness had hung about the men who hunted me over the Scotch moor in an aeroplane and a motor car, and notably about that infernal antiquarian. It was easy enough to connect those folk with the knife that pinned Scudder to the floor and with fell designs on the world's peace. But here were two guileless citizens taking their innocuous exercise, and soon about to go indoors to a humdrum dinner, where they would talk of market prices and the last cricket scores, and the gossip of their native Sir Byton. I had been making a net to catch vultures and falcons, and lo and behold, two plump thrushes had blundered into it. Presently a third figure arrived, a young man on a bicycle with a bag of golf clubs slung on his back. He strolled round to the tennis lawn and was welcomed riotously by the players. Evidently they were chaffing him, and their chaff sounded horribly English. Then the plump man, mopping his brow with a silk handkerchief, announced that he must have a tub. I heard his very words. "'I've gotten to a proper lather,' he said. "'This will bring down my weight and my handicap, Bob.' I'll take you on tomorrow and give you a stroke a hole. You couldn't find anything much more English than that. They all went into the house and left me feeling a precious idiot. I had been barking up the wrong tree this time. These men might be acting, but if they were, where was their audience? They didn't know I was sitting thirty yards off in a rhododendron. It was simply impossible to believe that these three hearty fellows were anything but what they seemed. Three ordinary, game-playing, suburban Englishmen, wearisome, if you like, but sordidly innocent. And yet there were three of them, and one was old, one was plump, and one was lean and dark. And their house chimed in with Scudder's notes, and half a mile off was lying a steam yacht with at least one German officer. 
I thought of Corolides lying dead and all Europe trembling on the edge of earthquake, and the men I had left behind me in London who were waiting anxiously for the events of the next hours. There was no doubt that hell was afoot somewhere. The black stone had won, and if it survived this June night would bank its winnings. There seemed only one thing to do, go forward as if I had no doubts, and if I was going to make a fool of myself to do it handsomely. Never in my life have I faced a job with greater disinclination. I would rather in my then mind have walked into a den of anarchists, each with his browning handy, or faced a charging lion with a pop gun, than enter that happy home of three cheerful Englishmen and tell them that their game was up. How they would laugh at me! But suddenly I remembered a thing I once heard in Rhodesia from old Peter Pienaar. I have quoted Peter already in this narrative. He was the best scout I ever knew, and before he had turned respectable, he had been pretty often on the windy side of the law, when he had been wanted badly by the authorities. Peter once discussed with me the question of disguises, and he had a theory which struck me at the time. He said, barring absolute certainties like fingerprints, mere physical traits were very little use for identification if the fugitive really knew his business. He laughed at things like dyed hair and false beards and such childish follies. The only thing that mattered was what Peter called atmosphere. If a man could get into perfectly different surroundings from those in which he had been first observed, and this is the important part, really play up to these surroundings and behave as if he had never been out of them, he would puzzle the cleverest detectives on earth. And he used to tell a story of how he once borrowed a black coat and went to church and shared the same hymn book of the man that was looking for him. If that man had seen him in decent company before, he would have recognized him, but he had only seen him snuffing the lights in a public house with a revolver. The recollection of Peter's talk gave me the first real comfort that I had had that day. Peter had been a wise old bird, and these fellows I was after were about the pick of the aviary. What if they were playing Peter's game? A fool tries to look different. A clever man looks the same and is different. Again there was that other maxim of Peter's which had helped me when I had been a roadman. If you are playing a part, you will never keep it up unless you convince yourself that you are it. That would explain the game of tennis. Those chaps didn't need to act. They just turned a handle and passed into another life, which came as naturally to them as the first. It sounds a platitude, but Peter used to say that it was the big secret of all the famous criminals. It was now getting on for eight o'clock, and I went back and saw Scaife to give him his instructions. I arranged with him how to place his men, and then went for a walk, for I didn't feel up to any dinner. I went round the deserted golf course, and then to a point on the cliffs farther north beyond the line of the villas. On the little trim, newly made roads, I met people in flannels coming back from tennis and the beach, and a coast guard from the wireless station, and donkeys and pirates padding homewards. Out at sea in the blue dusk, I saw lights appear on the Ariadne and on the destroyer away to the south, and beyond the cock sands, the bigger lights of steamers making for the Thames. The whole scene was so peaceful and ordinary that I got more dashed in spirits every second. It took all my resolution to stroll towards Trafalgar Lodge about half past nine. On the way I got a piece of solid comfort from the sight of a greyhound that was swinging along at a nursemaid's heels. He reminded me of a dog I used to have in Rhodesia, and of the time when I took him hunting with me in the Pali Hills. We were after a raybok, the dun kind, and I recollected how we had followed one beast, and both he and I had clean lost it. A greyhound works by sight, and my eyes are good enough, 
but that buck simply leaked out of the landscape. Afterwards, I found out how he managed it. Against the grey rock of the Copes, it showed no more than a crow against a thundercloud. It didn't need to run away. All it had to do was to stand still and melt into the background. Suddenly, as these memories chased across my brain, I thought of my present case and applied the moral. The black stone didn't need to bolt. They were quietly absorbed into the landscape. I was on the right track, and I had jammed that down in my mind and vowed never to forget it. The last word was with Peter PNR. Scaife's men would be posted now, but there was no sign of a soul. The house stood as open as a marketplace for anybody to observe. A three-foot railing separated it from the cliff road. The windows on the ground floor were all open and shaded lights on the low sound of voices revealed where the occupants were finishing dinner. Everything was as public and above board as a charity bazaar. Feeling the greatest fool on earth, I opened the gate and rang the bell. A man of my sort, who has traveled about the world in rough places, gets on perfectly well with two classes, what you may call the upper and the lower. He understands them, and they understand him. I was at home with herds and tramps and roadmen, and I was sufficiently at my ease with people like Sir Walter and the men I had met the night before. I can't explain why, but it is a fact. But what fellows like me don't understand is the great comfortable, satisfied middle-class world, the folk that live in villas and suburbs. He doesn't know how they look at things, he doesn't understand their conventions, and he is as shy of them as of a black mamba. When a trim parlor-maid opened the door, I could hardly find my voice. I asked for Mr. Appleton and was ushered in. My plan had been to walk straight into the dining room, and by a sudden appearance, wake in the men that start of recognition which would confirm my theory. But when I found myself in that neat hall, the place mastered me. There were the golf clubs and tennis rackets, the straw hats and caps, the rows of gloves, the sheaf of walking sticks, which you will find in 10,000 British homes. A stack of neatly folded coats and waterproofs covered the top of an old oak chest. There was a grandfather clock ticking, and some polished brass warming pans on the walls, and a barometer and a print of Chiltern winning the St. Ledger. The place was as orthodox as an Anglican church. When the maid asked me for my name, I gave it automatically, and was shown into the smoking room on the right side of the hall. That room was even worse. I hadn't time to examine it, but I could see some framed group photographs above the mantelpiece, and I could have sworn they were English public school or college. I had only one glance, for I managed to pull myself together and go after the maid, but I was too late. She had already entered the dining room and given my name to her master, and I had missed the chance of seeing how the three took it. When I walked into the room, the old man at the head of the table had risen and turned round to meet me. He was in evening dress, a short coat and black tie, as was the other, whom I called in my mind the plump one. The third, the dark fellow, wore a blue serge suit and a soft white collar and the colors of some club or school. The old man's manner was perfect. M Mr. Hannay? he said hesitatingly. Did you wish to see me? One moment, you fellows, and I'll rejoin you. We had better go to the smoking room. Though I hadn't an ounce of confidence in me, I forced myself to play the game. I pulled up a chair and sat down on it. I think we have met before, I said, and I guess you know my business. The light in the room was dim, but so far as I could see their faces, they played the part of mystification very well. Maybe, maybe, said the old man. 
I haven't a very good memory, but I'm afraid you must tell me your errand, sir, for I really don't know it. Well then, I said, and all the time I seem to myself to be talking pure foolishness, I have come to tell you that the game's up. I have a warrant for the arrest of you three gentlemen. Arrest? said the old man, and he looked really shocked. Arrest? Good God, what for? For the murder of Franklin Scudder in London on the 23rd day of last month. Uh, I've never heard that name before, said the old man in a dazed voice. One of the others spoke up. That was the Portland Place murder. I read about it. Good heavens, you must be mad, sir. Where do you come from? Scotland Yard, I said. After that, for a minute, there was utter silence. The old man was staring at his plate and fumbling with a nut, the very model of innocent bewilderment. Then the plump one spoke up. He stammered a little, like a man picking his words. Don't get flustered, uncle, he said. It is all a ridiculous mistake, but these things happen sometimes, and we can easily set it right. It won't be hard to prove our innocence. I can show that I was out of the country on the 23rd of May, and Bob was in a nursing home. You were in London, but you can explain what you were doing. Right, Percy. Of course, that's easy enough. The 23rd, that was the day after Agatha's wedding. Let me see. What was I doing? I came up in the morning from Woking and launched at the club with Charlie Simmons. Then, oh yes, I dined with the fishmongers. I remember, for the punch didn't agree with me, and I was seedy next morning. Hang it all, there's the cigar box I bought back from the dinner. He pointed to an object on the table and laughed nervously. I think, sir, said the young man, addressing me respectfully, you will see you are mistaken. We want to assist the law like all Englishmen, and we don't want Scotland Yard to be making fools of themselves. That's so, Uncle? Certainly, Bob. The old fellow seemed to be recovering his voice. Certainly. We'll do anything in our power to assist the authorities. But... But this is a bit too much. I can't get over it. How Nellie will chuckle, said the plump man. She always said that you would die of boredom because nothing ever happened to you. And now you've got it thick and strong. And he began to laugh very pleasantly. By Jove, yes. Just think of it. What a story to tell at the club. Really, Mr. Hannay, I suppose I should be angry to show my innocence, but it's too funny. I almost forgive you the fright you gave me. You looked so glum. I thought I might have been walking in my sleep and killing people. It couldn't be acting. It was too confoundedly genuine. My heart went into my boots. My first impulse was to apologize and clear out. But I told myself I must see it through, even though I was to be the laughingstock of Britain. The light from the dinner table candlesticks was not very good and to cover my confusion, I got up, walked to the door, and switched on the electric light. The sudden glare made them blink, and I stood scanning the three faces. Well, I made nothing of it. One was old and bald, one was stout, one was dark and thin. There was nothing in their appearance to prevent them being the three who had hunted me in Scotland, but there was nothing to identify them. I simply can't explain why I, who, as a roadman, had looked into two pairs of eyes, and as Ned Ainsley into another pair, why I, who have a good memory and reasonable powers of observation, could find no satisfaction. They seemed exactly what they professed to be, and I could not have sworn to one of them. There in that pleasant dining room, with etchings on the walls and a picture of an old lady in a bib above the mantelpiece, I could see nothing to connect them with the moorland desperados. 
There was a silver cigarette box beside me, and I saw that it had been won by Percival Appleton Esquire of the St. Bede's Club in a golf tournament. I had to keep a firm hold of Peter Pienaar to prevent myself bolting out of that house. Well, said the old man politely, are you reassured by your scrutiny, sir? I couldn't find a word. I hope you'll find it consistent with your duty to drop this ridiculous business. I make no complaint, but you'll see how annoying it must be to respectable people. I shook my head. Oh, Lord, said the young man, this is a bit too thick. Do you propose to march us off to the police station? asked the plump one. That might be the best way out of it, but I suppose you won't be content with the local branch. I have the right to ask to see your warrant, but I don't wish to cast any aspersions upon you. You are only doing your duty, but you'll admit it's horribly awkward. What do you propose to do? There was nothing to do except to call in my men and have them arrested, or to confess my blunder and clear out. I felt mesmerized by the whole place, by the air of obvious innocence. Not innocence merely, but frank, honest bewilderment and concern in the three faces. Oh, Peter Pienaar, I groaned inwardly, and for a moment I was very near damning myself for a fool and asking their pardon. Meantime, I vote we have a game of bridge, said the plump one. It will give Mr. Hannay time to think over things, and you know we have been wanting a fourth player. Do you play, sir? I accepted as if it had been an ordinary invitation at the club. The whole business had mesmerized me. We went into the smoking room where a card table was set out, and I was offered things to smoke and drink. I took my place at the table in a kind of dream. The window was open, and the moon was flooding the cliffs and sea with a great tide of yellow light. There was moonshine, too, in my head. The three had recovered their composure and were talking easily, just the kind of slangy talk you will hear in any golf club house. I must have cut a rum figure, sitting there knitting my brows with my eyes wandering. My partner was the young, dark one. I play a fair hand at bridge, but I must have been rank bad that night. They saw that they had got me puzzled, and that put them more than ever at their ease. I kept looking at their faces, but they conveyed nothing to me. It was not that they looked different, they were different. I clung desperately to the words of Peter Pienaar. Then something awoke me. The old man laid down his hand to light his cigar. He didn't pick it up at once, but sat back for a moment in his chair with his fingers tapping on his knees. It was the movement I remembered when I had stood before him in the moorland farm with the pistols of his servants behind me. A little thing lasting only a second, and the odds were a thousand to one that I might have had my eyes on my cards at the time and missed it, but I didn't. And in a flash, the air seemed to clear. Some shadow lifted from my brain, and I was looking at the three men with full and absolute recognition. The clock on the mantelpiece struck ten o'clock. The three faces seemed to change before my eyes and reveal their secrets. The young one was the murderer. Now I saw cruelty and ruthlessness, where before I had only seen good humor. His knife, I made certain, had skewered Scudder to the floor. His kind had put the bullet in Corolides. The plump man's features seemed to dislim and form again as I looked at them. He hadn't a face, only a hundred masks that he could assume when he pleased. That chap must have been a superb actor. Perhaps he had been Lord Aloha of the night before. Perhaps not. It didn't matter. I wondered if he was the fellow who had first tracked Scudder and left his card on him. 
Scudder had said he lisped, and I could imagine how the adoption of a lisp might add terror. But the old man was the pick of the lot. He was sheer brain, icy, cool, calculating, as ruthless as a steam hammer. Now that my eyes were opened, I wondered where I had seen the benevolence. His jaw was like chilled steel, and his eyes had the inhuman luminosity of a bird's. I went on playing, and every second a greater hate welled up in my heart. It almost choked me, and I couldn't answer when my partner spoke. Only a little longer could I endure their company. Phew! Bob, look at the time, said the old man. You'd better think about catching your train. Bob's got to go to town tonight, he added, turning to me. The voice rang now as false as hell. I looked at the clock, and it was nearly half past ten. I'm afraid he must put off his journey, I said. Oh, damn, said the young man. I thought you had dropped that rot. I've simply got to go. You can have my address, and I'll give any security you like. No, I said. You must stay. At that, I think they must have realized that the game was desperate. Their only chance had been to convince me that I was playing the fool, and that had failed. But the old man spoke once again. I'll go bail for my nephew. That ought to content you, Mr. Hannay. Was it fancy, or did I detect some halt in the smoothness of that voice? There must have been... For as I glanced at him, his eyelids fell in that hawk-like hood which fear had stamped on my memory. I blew my whistle. In an instant the lights were out. A pair of strong arms gripped me round the waist, covering the pockets in which a man might be expected to carry a pistol. Schnell, Franz! cried a voice. Das Boot! Das Boot! As it spoke, I saw two of my fellows emerge on the moonlit lawn. The young dark man leapt for the window, was through it, and over the low fence before a hand could touch him. I grappled the old chap, and the room seemed to fill with figures. I saw the plump one collared, but my eyes were all for the out-of-doors where Franz sped on over the road towards the railed entrance to the beach stairs. One man followed him but he had no chance. The gate of the stairs locked behind the fugitive, and I stood staring with my hands on the old boy's throat for such a time as a man might take to descend those steps to the sea. Suddenly my prisoner broke from me and flung himself on the wall. There was a click as if a lever had been pulled, then came a low rumbling far, far below the ground and through the window I saw a cloud of chalky dust pouring out of the shaft of the stairway. Someone switched on the light. The old man was looking at me with blazing eyes. He is safe, he cried. You cannot follow in time. He is gone. He has triumphed. Der Schwarzstein ist in der Siegeskron. There was more in those eyes than any common triumph. They had been hooded like a bird of prey, and now they flamed with a hawk's pride. A white, fanatic heat burned in them, and I realized for the first time the terrible thing I had been up against. This man was more than a spy. In his foul way, he had been a patriot. As the handcuffs clinked on his wrists, I said my last word to him. I hope Franz will bear his triumph well. I ought to tell you that the Ariadne, for the last hour, has been in our hands. Seven weeks later, as all the world knows, we went to war. I joined the new army the first week, and owing to my Metabale experience, got a captain's commission straight off. But I had done my best service, I think, before I put on the khaki. End of the 39 Steps by John Buchan